customer acquisition in a crowding casino space and crowded the space it certainly is and I'm pretty sure my uh, esteemed panelists will agree with me. You know, it's no secret that customer acquisition costs for social play for fun casinos have skyrocketed, causing some social gaming providers to offer some innovative solutions to acquire new players. One example is to offer a player to watch a video. Often, it's from a competitor's site. Once they do, the player earns additional virtual currency. The advertiser pays a fee either for purview or download. But imagine that you're advertising a competitor's platform. And of course, there's also acquisition through Facebook, although that appears to be softening as well, not, uh, on the Canvas side, not on the mobile side. And also, let's be clear about the impact of the new policies set by Apple on the App Store around the clone apps. That seems to be affecting some players as well on the user acquisition side. But another approach to acquire players has been through uh, acquisitions such as Aristocrat did this past November, paying over $990 million to acquire Big Fish games. And as you already know, Aristocrat operates a very successful social gaming platform called Product Madness. This leads to the question, has the North American market reached maturity? We'll actually, discover, uh, we'll actually cover each of these burnings uh, issues with our distinguished panel. And one thing I mentioned to our panelists earlier when we we're meeting on the side here, that's not really a competitive edge around user acquisition. It's more around player retention. And I think Adam Krychek covered that clearly in the first session earlier today about how platforms have evolved over time, and it's all about on the retention side. Um, I'll do something different. I'd like for the audience to be able to ask questions during the session. I really don't like to wait to the end, because at the time, there might be some burning issue, and by the end of the session, it's no longer uh, has any sizzle. So if you have any questions for our panelists, please raise your hand, and they'll come over quickly and give you a microphone. If I don't pay attention, say, hey, Frank, I have a question out here. Please do that as well. Sometimes I just carry it away. Um, for each of our panels, I'll introduce you, and if you could provide a brief description of your background in the industry, what you do in your current position, and also, tell us some fun fact about you. Anything, could be a hobby, anything like that. One fun fact about me is I love golf, but golf hates me. Let's start with uh, Monty Kerr, the Senior Vice President of Games at Zynga. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much me. So, I've been in this industry forever. I've been building games for 20 plus years, but uh, specifically in the casino space since 1998. Did Roman Casino for a while uh, online, and then uh, you know, rode the ride through Social Casino uh, as the founder and chief product officer of Play Studios, and then now I run Zynga's card game strategy, which includes uh, the number one poker game in the world, Zynga Poker. Um, you know, the I should have prepared some interesting fact about myself, um, but I didn't. So, uh, you know, I just want to say that this, again, this is like one of my favorite shows of the year. Uh, and it, it's not because of, the, of us and the content we bring, it's because of you guys. And, you know, every important meeting I've had here has been in the hallways after these meetings talking to people who are enthusiastic about this space. So, uh, I just want to take my interesting fact time opportunity to thank you guys for coming. and. Uh, we really appreciate it. My name's uh, Thomas Hopkins. I head up acquisition and marketing for Penn Interactive Ventures, um, which also acquired Rocket Speed or Rocket Games. Um, we're the iGaming division for Penn National Gaming, which is, um, I believe, the second largest uh, land-based casino operator in the US, and we are their iGaming division. I've been in gaming now for about three years, and I've been in marketing for about six. My name is Cyrus Lee. Um, I'm a UA manager and a monetization manager um, at the company that Monty found, Play Studios. Um, Good job. <laughs> oh, let's go back to the interesting fact real quick. Uh, interesting fact is that um, I enjoy playing water polo in my spare time, and it's mostly because of the Speedos. Um, yeah, I beat that. Yeah, I, got, I beat that. Um, before Play Studios, I was kind of on the indie track, um, basically working at a very small studio in SF um, with tight-knit friends. Uh, my fun fact is um, I think I'm a weird person because I find UA interesting. 
And a lot of people, I think, on the side just think it's boring or it's solved. But for some reason or another, I find it interesting. This is like an interesting question. And what I want to offer our panelists, if anyone can answer the question, just speak up and, and, and chime in. But I'm going to just throw one over there. And I know it's a, one that's asked of you all the time. You know, what do you, what do you, each of you are doing to attract and acquire new players? I think I'll start on that. So I think that it, it really comes down to thinking about your product and your game as you know holistically and and understanding how your product differentiates from the market so being that we're a land-based casino operator um, we like to look at it from that perspective and and so the way that we're doing most of our acquisition right now is trying to rely on our database and rely on that organic traffic that comes from working with our brands and our casinos across the country and then tying in our user acquisition strategy around that um, so advertising in those locales as well as um, you know, doing retargeting campaigns as much as we can uh, around those specific customers. So I'm going to call it officially in 2018, we're a mature industry. We're no longer this scrappy set of entrepreneurs who are building a business and figuring out creative and ways to build an audience. We're a real mature industry to, to get onto the Adam Krychek charts, we had to crawl over 1,400, 1,500 dead companies that tried to do what we're doing. And so it's a tough space. So what we've done now is, you know, we and our partners at uh, all the different platforms and all the agencies and companies we work with, we've got a pretty big system. There's not a ton of differentiation between, you know, uh, Zynga's strategy and anybody else's strategy. Uh, it's really about the products that we're building and the audiences that we've, we've, we've built. So whenever we talk, probably if we get into any of the granular details about what we do, it's going to be any company. You know, there's nothing that I'm doing that these guys aren't doing at the same time. I'll just add on the, on the uh, practical level. Um, a lot of our spend is obviously on the, the social networks and the video ad networks, standard performance marketing arenas. Um, we go and try to chase the long tail every so often and usually just get burned, but we do that sometimes. Uh, but yeah, there, there's no uh, magic, I would say. Well, then actually the next question is interesting. Adam touched on it earlier. What's your opinion on expanding into tangential gaming genres? For example, mentioned about Play Ticket with their words for slots game and Aristocrats product madness with their recent acquisition of Plarium. In your opinion, does this type of diversification make sense? Does this give a, them a new opportunity around UA? Okay, so I'll do it. <laughs> um, you know, we don't have a single su success story of any type of, um, you know, breakout product that combines, you know, uh, the excitement of a role-playing game with the card counting of blackjack or, you know, the, the concept of a mashup in our space of taking, I, I had this classic example that I used called crapjack, you know, which is, you know, we're going to combine, combine the excitement of a craps table with a blackjack game. You know, I think that it's natural for us to try to innovate in our space. It's natural for us to try to go after another demographic. We've got a tremendous penetration into people who want to play slot machines, right? We, we, I think any, the, that while the smartphone penetration with 65 plus is still growing, that's, that's our new emerging market, you know? So it is, it is the, we're going to try it. We're going to try all kinds of crazy stuff to find out if we can, you know, uh, uh, get people who like the excitement volatility of a slot machine and play something else. But do I have a lot of hope that somebody's going to come up with you know, the, a, a street fighter meets a slot machine game and it suddenly becomes the thing everybody plays? No, I don't have a lot of confidence in that. But, you know, this is really largely an attempt for most of us to try to find, uh, you know, audiences that, um, that are on the cusp. You know, people who have interest in, uh, you know, the random game elements of a casino game, but have broader interest as well. Yeah, I can offer a little bit of insight there as well. So um, at Rocket Speed or Rocket Games, um, before we acquired Penn, or Penn acquired them, 
we did a lot of um, new games, and what we saw was that within Social Casino, within slots, within classic slots, um, every time we launched new titles, it ended up being the exact same players um, that we already had on our other titles. So I think that buying these new products or these new games and these new demo are, are basically going after new demographics and trying to see if we can they can get growth that way um, because I think they're seeing these companies are seeing similar things that we're seeing that it's more or less looking like the the growth tra trajectories have changed and it's become a little bit more saturated um, I, I guess I'll add it from the UA side it's it's more um, I see it maybe as a hedge for eyeballs um, as kind of CPI ECPM just keeps rising or ra like rising. Um, basically, um, when the acquisition or a new product comes out, it's, it's, it's kind of getting the eyeballs or the ad in a cheaper way. Um, I, I can kind of see it from that angle. You know, the, I think the bigger issue for me is that when you look at the Venn diagram of the games, most of these games, you're not getting all the people who like poker and all the people who like this other genre. You're getting the intersection between the two, meaning that, you know, if, if regardless of the size of that audience, it's going to be small and hopefully it's going to be valuable, but that's the problem is that, you know, um, uh, we, we, try to, we try to make the Venn diagram bigger, right, but often just get the intersection between them. So that actually leads to the next great question. In your opinion, um, you actually ha all have multiple apps, and do you cross prom promote between them? And if you do, is it really effective? Uh, with our rewards platform for Play Studios, um, obviously the cross promotion makes a lot more sense. Uh, there are a lot of people who are just grinding for free things, um, and basically they're there they're not gonna pay us a dime. They're just there to grind for free things. Um, so, you know, then I just multiply that and say, you can do that in another app, and then another app, and another app. So it, it makes sense in that context for us. Um, um, I, I think Play Studios has probably one of the best models for cross-promotion because there's something valuable for the player there. And I think that's the trick, right? You know, uh, I, can, I can show my player CSR2 videos all day long, but unless they're interested in CSR2, they're not going to leave poker to go play CSR2. It's one of the reasons that we're okay showing, some of us are sh okay showing competitive products. We know the players who are playing our game love our games, and it's okay if we see an ad for a competitor. They're not going to jump ship. Uh, they're not likely to jump ship. So, uh, and I think that, that Playtika made a major investment in their uh, loyalty program, so that if I log into World Series of Poker and get to a high tier, if I log into Slotomania, I'll, that high tier will be reflected there. I think that's a brilliant idea for trying to move your uh, most valuable players through the ecosystem. But they don't cross-promote, right? They let players discover those on their own. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I don't think, I think that the short answer for me is that cross-promotion has traditionally been the least effective form of acquisition, uh, but it's also the cheapest. So, you know, you just have to look at your opportunity costs. Yeah, I mean, I would say that cross-promotion kind of, you have to look at it in terms of where you are in your life cycle as a company. So there are definitely ways that you can use cross-promotion as an early stage startup to release new apps on, say, for example, the Play Store, and use each app as an opportunity to have new learnings, increase ARP DAOs, and then push those users to the next app that has you know, those things already figured out at the start of it. Um, and that's basically how Rocket Speed grew. And it's, there's other companies out there like um, uh, Super Lucky does, uh, used to have a similar model. Um, but I think it depends on where you are in your life cycle as a company. And I agree completely um, with the other panelists here that when you become a more mature title, unless you have something that you're sending them to that's, that is going to be of more value to them, um, it doesn't make sense to do cross promo other than if it's for like basically a churning player. Okay. And actually, in your opinion, where do, you, where do you think the most growth opportunity exists? Is it iOS? Is it Android? Is it Kindle? And once you select one of those, explain why. So 
I'm in a unique position here uh, with poker in particular because poker has has half a billion lapsed players, right? So, I mean, poker has been around for 10 years and uh, has in almost every country we've been in, been the most successful poker game. So the best channel for me to find new players is by trying to find those old players that I know love the game. But I've got half a billion of them. Play Studios doesn't, right? So um, uh, the other places that we've focused uh, is uh, on international growth. That's obviously a big deal. Android has been, a, uh, uh, has been growing for all of us dramatically in, over the last year or two. Uh, we think it'll continue to grow. Um, uh, poker, I think, is a really interesting business uh, in particular because we build this giant economy of lots of players. So the bigger we are, the more effective we are. That's why there's only two players in the poker space, uh, the number three players in order of magnitude smaller, right? Uh, that's not the case with slots where it's a single player game and you can do that. So, um, so anytime a new platform emerges, we want to be on that platform but we have a very stringent definition of what a platform is. You know, large addressable audience, the ability to monetize that audience either through in-app purchase, watch to earn, or the deep link to another app where I can do IAP or watch to earn. So, so, uh, and so we're looking closely at uh, Facebook Instant Games as an example of maybe that's a platform, right? But was, um, iMessage a platform? Well, there wasn't any ability to monetize the player through it. You know, discoverability was very difficult. So I think that we're watching, and you know, one of my jobs is to make sure that if we identify a new platform, to get poker there as fast as possible. Um, yeah, I'll be the fourth choice again. Uh, Facebook Instant Games makes the most sense for me, um, and also it's just because uh, the prices of the ECPM of when you're bidding there is, is currently not as high as the other ones, uh, the, other, the other sites of Facebook. I'm just going to say, obviously, most of our time spent on iOS and Android. Um, I mean, that's where all of the money is basically made. But we're actually seeing some very interesting things going on right now with web. So just standard, standalone WWW products. Um, there's a world in which, you know, the social casino world and the real money gambling starts to kind of come together in a way. And as you heard earlier, a lot of the real money gambling stuff's on HTML5. So we believe HTML5 is actually where we're going to be in three to five years. Um, we've already got one product in HTML5. The technology from a hardware perspective isn't necessarily there to run well on a lot of devices, but we believe it will be there. I think that all of us that have a substantial Facebook Canvas presence are looking for uh, to avoid the flash apocalypse that's happening. So, and that's made us invest in new technologies and, and gotten, I think it's gotten us all excited about web. I mean, you know, I'm looking at uh, a bigger investment in, in web in general, not just on Facebook Canvas, but elsewhere. So I, I think that there's, uh, you know, one of the things that you're gonna see from us trying to avoid this, uh, uh, you know, flaming end to flash gaming is that we're all going to have to invest in, in new web technologies, which I think is going to revitalize web to some degree. You know, it's interesting when we launched a uh, social gaming product, I forgot how many, two or three years ago, it was interesting. We also felt that mobile would be the number one, you know, uh, majority of, of players. And it was in, on the casino side, it was actually web. It was 50-50. But now it's kind of matured to a 60-40 mobile, 60, now it's like a 70-30, it's kind of leveled out there. But, so you're right, you can't ignore the web because it's not gonna go away. And that's also a great opportunity. Well, all of you touched on this, and we talked about user acquisitions costs have increased, and we all know they're not gonna go any, down anytime soon. Do you think some more social casino players will start putting social ads within their game? Meaning the free-to-play market seems to be evolving towards more view-to-play. You know, we had the, talked about Rodeo uh, Stampede. Does this follow? I've noticed it's a very hot topic, and I've seen this as a changing strategy in the past year with Big Fish, Huge, and allowing competitor ads. And my guess is Big Fish and Huge are not sending over their players who monetize, but their players who don't monetize over a period of time. So really, what is that quality of acquisition? Or do you disagree with me that you're sending all your players? Or, you know, I'm just curious to what segment of players you'd send over and, and actually how much will 
eventually monetize when they're not monetizing in your platform? I, I think those acquisition um, kind of channels are, are going to have to be part of people's strategy. I, I don't think we can keep chasing higher CPIs. Um, and I think that the more sophisticated with segmentation and with our modeling we become, the more we're comfortable uh, with showing competitor ads. It's just interesting to me where people maybe three, four, five years ago said absolutely no competitor ads. And you kind of see this change in, in some of the top 15 that they're slowly allowing some or on some contingent uh, segmentation, which is really interesting. So we don't make a lot of money from showing ads. Most high ARP DAO games don't, right? So yeah, we'll show watch to earn for non-monetizing players or uh, players who seem to be lagging in engagement or growing in engagement, but we're, that's not a major source of uh, revenue for any high ARP dial game. You know, we advertise. So if my competitors want to take my ads, I I'll I'll spend. You know, I just don't think that that there's a lot of inventory in my competitors' apps for my games. Um, but you know, th that said, uh, we're spending money in games that that do generate most of their money through uh, re ad revenue, right? So, um, and those are games that have incredibly low CPIs. So Solitaire is a great example. We acquired a Solitaire game uh, in February of last year. It has an incredibly low CPI because Solitaire's, you know, everybody's, everybody's interested in Solitaire on some level, right? So it's easy to acquire a player and we can show those players ads in and it's arbitrage. Our business is largely arbitrage. We don't use that word a lot, but that's what we do. We acquire players as cheaply as we can and monetize them as much as we can. It's just arbitrage. And so that's where the, the UA comes in too, is we look for apps that are willing to accept uh, CPIs or, or eCPMs at the level we're willing to pay and, uh, you know, and try to build it from there. Sometimes, you know, we'll identify them uh, with a simple game like Solitaire. Solitaire, if you look at Solitaire, it's crazy you know, word games, social casino, that's, that's what it's full of, because that's where we're spending our money. Uh, match, you know, match 3 has a similar kind of quality where our demographics, they're playing those games anyway, and the cost of requiring them is cheap enough that we can advertise there. Well, I know we had some Agreed. changes by Apple within the new App Store. I was curious, did any of those changes affect any of you? Actually, I know one person they must have affected. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure you guys have all heard that Apple um, whole, you know, they're closing down a lot of the companies that are, you know, reskinning or launching new apps that are very similar to previous apps. Um, so something that's going on. So it's it's something where you know they're basically saying limiting companies to one to three apps. Um, and so it's, it's as long as they're in the same genre. So it's just something that you have to be cognizant of now. And the whole you know launching apps and cross promoting strategy as for a new like indie developer is not an option really anymore. So just something to consider. And, and, and you mentioned Super Lucky and a couple other companies who had great strategies putting out tons of apps. So. There is this weird truism with user acquisition that the first dollar you spend is much more effective than the last dollar you spend, right? This is it's just true. And if I had 50 apps, and each of those apps were taking 1 50th of my budget, it's going to perform better than if I spent all that money in one app. It's just the way that it, the way, I mean, it's, it's just natural. And I think it's a, it's a really innovative strategy. It's a really complicated strategy that depends, you know, that doesn't scale uh, and companies, like I can't really speak for uh, Nick, but my gut feeling is companies like Super Lucky is that they're trying to find uh, through this level of iteration, one, uh, to improve performance. You know, they learn something, the first app, that they put in the second app and, you know, they improve their first time user experience or their retention curve or whatever they have and they want their players to play that. But their goal is to find an app that is incredibly popular and successful, right? So. Putting out 50 apps means that maybe you find the Cleopatra style app that people, that's super exciting. Old school Vegas is a great example of that. So, uh, but it, that, that business just became a lot more complicated. Well, actually after looking back and hearing some of your responses, I'm sure someone on this panel has tried something crazy, like an out of a box idea around user acquisition. You know, could you opine on one of those, whether it was success, horror story, 
Any of you have anything that was out of the box? You know, I think that we were talking about this a little bit beforehand. It's just difficult for us to do, right? We're in, in a very mature competitive environment and uh, you know, we're trying to get our best return on ad spend uh, that we can. So everything is measured on return on ad spend. And, to, and, to, and, and we all, I think that <laughs> if you look at our daily investments, we're taking risks every day, but we're dividing those risks between the 140 partners that we're working with. So yeah, you know, the $3,000 I spent on this ad unit, uh, on this demographic return, nothing. That was a crazy risk but it's aggregated into a big risk that, you know, a big portfolio that was really hard to see. So would I like to do crazy branding things, you know, where, uh, you know, uh, we're the first poker game played on Mars? I would totally love to do that, right? You know, I just don't have the branding budget. You know, every year I'll sit down at the beginning and say, I'm gonna spend money on branding. I've got a game that half a billion people have installed. I've got one of the best known poker brands in the world. Let's invest in branding like, like major brands do. But by the time it's time to spend that money, you know, the CPIs have gone up, our env competitive environment's gotten tighter, things have gotten hotter in the space, and we use that money for something else. So I'd love to do that. And I think that every marketing person that's doing that would love to do that. It's just we just don't have the luxury. We just don't have the margins. So I, I kind of take that question in terms of you know new channels or new opportunities uh, as well as just new creative styles um, and I think those are kind of the two things that affect uh, you know great performance acquisition and basically um, what I feel like is on the new channel side it's you know unless you're the number one company that has a huge budget it's hard and a, and a big team it's very hard to go out and test all those different small channels and inevitably they work for a month or two um, and then everybody else finds them, or it ends up being something where you, f you take up all their inventory and that's it. Um, so I like to think about, you know, we used to have a lot of, you know, outside of the box creative styles um, that we would use that worked really well, but now with Facebook, basically with the whole fake news thing, you know, we're not really able to try a lot of the Facebook creatives that we used to do because now they're gonna be public for everyone to see. Um, so it's something that is, is, you know, causing it a little bit harder for us to be, you know, on the cutting edge for different types of creative. Um, no crazy wacky strategies, um, but every time I feel like I chase the long tail networks, I feel like it was crazy or wacky and I regret doing that. <laughs> but that's uh, the context. Well, you mentioned this earlier, Monty. We actually uh, agree that we probably believe that, you know, North America is actually a maturing market. And of course, specifically, the U.S. is the largest consumer of social games. Do you think the U.S. market is oversaturated for user acquisition? And if you do believe that, do you have plans for other countries or territories? If you look at one great example, Aristocrat, right now they get one third of their total revenue from Australia. So they apparently, you know, they kind of probably fell into that side as well because of their product being as popular there. And so, yes, yeah, yes. I think the average, what's the study I saw? The average slot player has eight slot apps on their phone. Yeah, we're, we're oversaturated. Uh, and, and I think that we're seeing that through the, this general inflation in CPIs, right? We're all competing for the same players over and over and over again. And you see them when you launch a new app, even though it's got a completely different branded, you start seeing the same players over and over again. However, players that are playing in multiple apps tend to monetize better. They tend to engage better, they tend to retain better because they like slot machines or they like poker games. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of the nature is we're just gonna start moving around the same players all the time. Uh, and, and what you're gonna see is the companies that, uh, that's why you see in Adam's share, uh, market shares, you know, through acquisition, through consolidation, uh, through uh, the ability to invest in a better app, to get better licenses, to, uh, you know, to put a better product in front of the customers, you see the market shares grow for those audience, for those teams. I think every, you know, three years ago, there was, you know, uh, the top 50% was like 15 companies. You know, two years ago, it was seven companies. Last year, it was five companies. This year, it's four companies, right? That's gonna continue to happen. And it's not just through consolidation and acquisition. It's uh, also because, uh, you know, these players are churning through you know, the 500 social casino apps that are out there and they're getting stuck on the ones 
that have the best gameplay, have the best licenses, has the best metagame, has the best progression, you know, has the best rewards, and, and, and they're not getting dislodged anymore. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough space, and that's why I think that, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's the reddest of red oceans. Uh, it's a tough space to be in. Thomas, do you want to talk, do you have any other aspirations to go outside in different territories outside of the North American market? I think it kind of comes back to, you know, what your core business is there for and what your strategy is around. Um, you know, from a Penn National perspective, we're more leaning into staying in the U.S. And so it becomes more of how do we win and retain our U.S. players that have the highest ARP DAOs. Um, and basically, so we're kind of leaning into that um, because international, international acquisition and retention becomes um, a little bit more of a uh, game that, you know, I would say we're a little bit behind on um, that would be tough to kind of catch up on at this point. Cyrus? Um, I th think I'll just use a short story, but uh, one of my first tasks at Play Studios was to get 400 installs in Australia. Um, and I, th I said, that's easy, every day. Um, and basically, it was the most stressful um, two months um, of my life. No, just kidding. Just most stressful two months of the, uh, at the company. Uh, but basically, um, specifically with Australia, it's everyone wants more installs there. And we talk to all our partners and say, can we have more installs in Australia? This is a very mature market. Uh, they understand slots, um, great users. Um, and basically, it's, uh, it's product madness and aristocrat stuff doing really well, and everyone else kind of just trying to keep pouring money and chasing it. I have the benefit. I, I remember going through the roller coaster ride of trying to go after new markets and play studios, and it was incredibly stressful. Uh, and we would make investments in you know, uh, licenses that we thought were popular or build games that we thought were popular there. And, and it was very difficult to do. Uh, and if you were successful, you were frustrated that the ARF DAOs went down because you got users in that market, but the users didn't spend as much money, so it hurt, it dragged down everything. Uh, Zynga Poker is really fascinating in that we're the number one poker game in the world in 74 of the 80 countries we track, but one of the countries that we're not number one in is the United States. We're number two to World Series of Poker in the United States. So, uh, uh, so we've been focused heavily on, on market share in emerging countries, Western countries, uh, you know, anywhere where poker is popular, because uh, we have a long tail view of, of poker. But you know, the battleground is in the United States. That's where you know that's where the high art dial users are, and uh, you know it's what it's where poker started. It's where poker's originated. It's where poker's popular. So obviously, we want to to claw back that market share from World Series of Poker. Well, actually, I have a specific question for Thomas, and you actually touched on this earlier. Penn Interactive has a tie-in with the Bricks and Mortar Casino, and you also have the unique ability to drive players to your property, of course, online, which is true convergence with marketing. Do you believe this gives you an advantage over a company like an Aristocrat or Zynga, which has no land-based tie-in? So for the past five years, um, it's all been about content. Right, it's whoever has the best content, whoever has the best game features and um, game lo loops. Do, you know, they're they're winning. Um, and what we've seen is that our you know our customers that are at the casinos that are playing online, their ARP DAOs are six to ten x um, what our other customers are. When we identify these are our casino customers, so yeah, we're trying to say basically let's lean into that, let's do the best we can. So. We're designing some basically systems and working heavily with our casino operators to put together systems that will allow us to start to add value to these customers in other ways other than just in-game experience. So Cyrus, you actually have a tie-in course with land-based casinos, we know that. Um, my assumption would lead me to believe that a majority of Play Studio customers are land-based customers, is that true? I think Monte can add to the answer that, but uh, I would say the, the interesting thing is when, no. I am, <laughs> when I am walking around Vegas, um, I do see the mobile app, you know, the ads for our social casino games. And what's odd about that, in my opinion, is, is that there's so much noise or so much flashing lights in Vegas that I, I would never, in my, as a performance marketer, I'm just like, would I even remember this? 
uh, or if I, would, I, would I be able to even differentiate a mobile app from another one? Um, I actually see the different content more, uh, but really those, those ads and those billboards like kind of make me go, oh, like I, so I don't know how to measure this. When I left Play Studios, we had 600 pieces of collateral in marketing collateral in Las Vegas. So MGM, we have a, we have a relationship with 10 MGM casinos on the strip. We had, uh, uh, so, and 600 pieces were, were like 600 different types of advertising. So banners in the parking garage, uh, we had, uh, you know, ATM uh, logo in screen uh, in, the, in the room, in the magazines. We had three billboards going on the airport. We were on every marquee outside the casino. We were on the login to Wi-Fi. I think I may have said that. We were on the bathroom video screen on the faucet. Uh, we had, I mean, we had sweet, so much collateral. And as a developer, it was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen in my whole life is you're, you're walking down the Las Vegas Strip and your game is 30 foot high on this marquee outside. It's awesome. And we found the same thing. The, the customers that installed that were also casino customers or hotel customers for MGM were incredibly valuable. They were worth many times more than the average person. They were just such a small audience. And uh, I don't think I'm betraying any confidence to say that when we put together Play Studios, our pitch was that a, the majority of those customers are gonna be from MGM. Right. And so, uh, but they weren't, they weren't. We've, we get customers the exact same way that everybody else gets customers in this space, it's just, if they also happen to be an MGM customer, an MGM rewards or MLife rewards user, uh, or uh, they're worth, they're more valuable. So I, I think that, that I, I wish I could only have MGM customers. That would be the best thing in the whole world, but you just can't. Well, Monty, it's funny you actually touched on it, the next question. Because I know you've previously worked at Play Studios, moving over to Zynga in 2016. So again, you went from a company that had tie into casinos, which of course benefited on the UA side, as we mentioned earlier, um, being able to tap into the casino database. But Zenga doesn't really have any tie-ins with land-based casinos. Do you see that as an impediment to you, or, or see what? as impediment, impediment for user uh, acquisition and player retention? No, you know, I don't. I, I would love to have a relationship with land-based casino because I think that my players would dig it, right? That's really what it is. I would like to send my VIPs there. I'd like for them to walk to the casino and see uh, my marketing materials there. I'd like them to play at Aria on a Zynga.com or a Zynga poker table. Um, I think those are things that would be awesome. Um, but, you know, the and I'm sure that customers that, were, that we were able to acquire through those channels would be more valuable. But it's just not, it, it hasn't been something that um, has worked, you know, serendipitously worked or uh, it just hasn't been valuable enough for us to, to pursue. And, you know, Play Studios has the best licenses anyway, so. Um, but uh, I don't think it's even an impediment. Uh, I do think that um, uh, not having a major branded real world tournament, like World Series of Poker or World Poker Tour, you know, is hard for uh, a poker app. Uh, and, but I don't think that it, you know, if, if, if Zynga hadn't shot itself in the foot uh, three years ago with uh, the Poker 2 dot launch, I don't think World Series of Poker would have gotten the audience it has. So, you know, I think it's a combination between us, uh, uh, you know, doing the right thing for our customers and, uh, not, and retaining our audience. And if we screw it up, we're gonna lose our audience and there's gonna be a competitor literally right there on your heels that's happy to make uh, those players uh, happy and keep them engaged. So it goes back to, you know, it's in the title, but retention is by far the most important of the two. And, and I think that that's what you're going to hear in 2018 is a de-emphasis on user acquisition and a renewed emphasis on retention and engagement. I got a question for you, Matia, on that. Is like, so for you know, Zynga Poker with the size that it is, um, and you look at a company like King, and they go out and they say, okay, we have this digital product, let's bring it to the real world and they have their you know, game show. So is that something that would ever make sense for a game like you know, Zynga Poker to come out and compete with the World Series of Poker and start to put together something like that, given your user base? You know, I think that we're so focused on, uh, on our, on our we have, we're, we're a big strategically focused company. So our overall strategy is connecting the world through games. You know, I have the strategy in my division of the world's most played card games. So we're focused on 
you know, excelling at the narrow thing that we do. And I think that there'll be partnerships, like we've done sponsoring opportunities with companies like Poker Central and, and Amazon uh, to, to, you know, bring our brand and our giant audience to these world world events. So I think you'll see more of those. Um, as poker certainly internationally gains in popularity, like the Indian Poker League is going completely crazy right now. Um, so we'll see it in China and some other countries uh, as well. And I think Zynga should be part of that. One of the, the goals that I had for my product was that whenever I, when I got to Zynga, you know, people kind of saw Zynga Poker as the uh, accessible poker game, kind of. And then once you got good at poker, you would graduate to a game like World Series of Poker. And I thought that was a terrible uh, position for us to be in. Although I love being accessible and having a great game that people who were learning poker is, but I wanted those super engaged, competitive players as well. So we spent a lot of energy uh, following this premium and authentic line. You know, we're in, in our, you know, over the last year and a half, we've improved the game dramatically. But part of premium and authentic is being where the players are, right? And I think the World Series of Poker has a tremendous advantage on that. And, you know, I'd like to you know, get to parity with them on that too. So maybe, but I just don't think it'll be a, a Zynga poker. I think we'll partner with somebody who's awesome as opposed to doing something on our own. Actually, question for Thomas. Um, money's no object here, and Penn Inventive can spend. And what other genres do you think would be innovative to be able to gain market share? So being that we're, you know, owned and operated by a real money gambling company, the idea is to stay in the social casino genre um, so that we can continue to build up our database and build up our users within that space um, because those are the users that we can, you know, have come into our casinos, drive into the casinos um, and acquire them for a much lower price. So, you know, we see Solitaire, um, Bingo as other products that we'd want to get into and, you know, something that we're... I would do Solitaire, it's not worth it. <laughs> Stay away from that one. <laughs> Any card game, it's a bad idea. <laughs> I have to laugh about that because this last question is from Marty. We talked about acquisitions earlier. And looking at, you know, Aristocrat, Crime, Big Fish, and recently, and then Zanga's acquisition of Peak Games and Harpin and Solitaire. In addition to, you know, acquiring a new user base, what was the premise behind both of those acquisitions? Well, I inherited Zynga Poker, and, and Zynga Poker was a strategy in its own, right? It's a, Biggest poker game in the world. We had a, uh, um, you know, a, a vision to improve the game, but I really had, in tearing apart why is poker so popular, I, I, I got on this uh, vision of this, these culturally significant evergreen games, games that families play, games that, uh, gener that are generational, that grandparents will play with grandkids, that uh, are uh, super important uh, in, in, a, in a local setting, not in an in a, in a international setting. And so I started looking into these games and I found games like Dodizu in China and OK in Turkey and uh, Durak in Russia and Teen Petit in India that, that are, these games are competing against Clash of Clans and Zynga Poker and uh, Candy Crush and, on the charts. And, but only in these tiny regions. The, uh, uh, OK is a, is a rummy style tile-based game that, that people play while they have drinks with their friends and family at home in Turkey in the evening. But three of the top 20 grossing games were OK games. Uh, two of the top 10 grossing games and the number one top grossing game were OK games. And so I'm like, this is a really interesting space. Why? And, and, and it's geographically Turkey nothing outside even in neighboring regions. Why is that the case? So I hung up, I got hung up on this concept of these culturally significant games and so I started looking into them and I went after Solitaire first because Solitaire uh, seemed, we were spending a lot of money advertising in Solitaire games so I'm like okay, worst case scenario, Solitaire is just a, a type O donor to our other games if it doesn't do anything else. Uh, but then I, saw, then I found uh, the Peak's card games. We didn't acquire Peak as a company. We acquired the card game studio, 44 people in Istanbul. They had the number one gin rummy game, the number one spades game uh, in the world. And so and that's the kind of strategy I'm doing. So I think that there's this, so we, that morphed into this most played card game strategy. Uh, and I'm, 
hoping to find interesting network effects between these games. For example, uh, uh, poker is incredibly popular in Turkey. It's, a, it's one of our best uh, markets. Okay, well now I've got the most played card game in Turkey as well. So I've got three of the top 10 grossing games in Turkey. Well, maybe I can move them from the low ArcDAO okay game over to the high ArcDAO poker game. I don't know, we're gonna try all kinds of stuff. So, but you know, that's one of the awesome things about you know, having $700 million in the bank is that we can go after a strategy and put together a whole strategy instead of just saying, we're gonna be awesome at poker. So Cyrus, question for you. I know you always have relationships, and all your relationships are actually with casinos, except one, you know, you had the Konami. What was the thought process, and why did you, you know, can you, can you explain to the audience why you did a deal with a slot manufacturer that has no land-based tie-in, meaning directly to a casino? I think it's smart to actually defer to Monty on this one again. <laughs> it makes way more sense. Well, the strategy was user acquisition, right? It, we thought that that was gonna be a great way for us to get content in the games and get access to all these, these uh, uh, new customers that, that like the casinos. And, and I love the manufacturing deals. I think they're just, just fantastic, right? The, they've got, they, they make hundreds of games a year. Of those hundreds of games they make, three or four or five become very popular. They invest all their money in getting those physically into properties, meaning that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that there's this R&D and this survival of the fittest in these game designs, so you get really good games. Uh, at, when I was at Play Studios, I don't think that we didn't ship a game that we built. We never built a game and said, oh, this game's kind of terrible, and threw it away. We shipped it because it was, because we'd already invested in it, and, and we might as well ship the, it. The, the large, uh, for at least the large majority of like the first and second year roadmaps yeah. of the game. Yeah, so, but that's not the way that the land-based casino, uh, the manufacturers work. So, you know, so getting these incredibly tried and true uh, uh, game content uh, uh, you know, we hoped it would reduce user acquisition, but everybody else had the same strategy, so it didn't. Um, but I, you know, I think it, it, w what ultimately paid off was the quality of the content, right? Retention, not acquisition. Yeah, I can offer there as well. So from our HollywoodCasino.com product, which is a mobile product as well, it's a scientific games product. Um, great content. Um, they spend their entire, you know, you know, a company doing, working on the content, making great content. And um, it would be great to set up a casino where we have everyone's content, um, you know, and then we, we can start to get in a world where we are being able to provide, you know, the exact same experience um, that they get in the casino. So, um, I mean, there's a strategy there too, but I think it, it really comes down to um, what type of deal you're able to put together with these companies. Um, you know, obviously there's margins that we're all trying to hit, and you basically are just doing a calculation on, is it gonna help in terms of CPI and ARPDAO? And is that additional cost you're spending to have that content worth it? In the, in the Adam Krychek talk, one of the questions was, how does a new company compete with these leaders? And I think that the answer, and he said, it's, it's marketing, right? You have to have deep marketing po pockets to really go after them. And I think that that's another advantage that these big companies has is that we can not only afford to uh, spend a ton of money, we can spend money on uh, licenses that you know, improve retention, improve engagement, uh, uh, give us access to an audience that already loves that product. Uh, in addition, and small companies really struggle with that. I think that our Zynga um, slots division has 180 entertainment licenses. Right, and that's just hard to do if you're, you know, a small company who's raised a little bit of money, or you're using the the, the rocket or a super lucky strategy of just putting a bunch of products out there and looking for something that really connects to the user. That's hard to compete with. No one can argue uh, successful floor content games being part of your social gaming strategy on your part of your platform. Can, can it's just. You have to, right? If you want to build, at least if you bring them onto your site and then able to do other retention policies, push them onto other games, but to bring them on the site, especially with Zynga's partnership with Konami, that's brilliant, right? It's all about user acquisition there. So, I mean, Play Studios, yes. So that's, that, that's an excellent play. It'd be interesting to see in the future whether um, relationships are, are formed where if they're not into the B2C side, which Konami wasn't, you know, it's a brilliant move. I don't know, Merca did a really good job of putting together a compelling experience that 
and they focused on the kind of the that gothic look and feel and the metagame element around it. I think that the old school, uh, you know, stuff that Rocket did was innovative, Xing of people. Um, you know. Nice plug. <laughs> but I, so I think it is possible, and I think that what's going to happen, and I, what I hope happens to everybody in this room and everybody else out there, is that that I I want you guys to innovate. I want you guys to find the new hook. And it's not going to be, you know, maybe it is going to be a mashup, but I'm hoping it's what it's going to be is something that is just missing from the market. We didn't realize that people wanted steppers, you know, in an app. Why would anybody want a three-year-old mechanical slot machine when I can build a crazy slot machine? We had no idea that people wanted that, right? So there's other stuff out there, you know. Maybe it's going to be the Game King video poker on the blue background, yellow and black and white cards. Maybe that's what people are missing right now. And, but I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be something, but I can promise you that it's not going to be us that finds it. It's going to be you guys that find it. It's going to be us that acquires you. So find it. You know, that's actually, that's a great closing on that note. Um, last year, I moderated a panel. We talked about content and unique content and love the challenges, the developers in the audience to do something to change the space to make it innovative, to think outside the box. Don't just look at the table games and the slot machines that we have today. Just do something totally different. And we'd love to see, you know, eventually that product next year in this space where we can talk about it. But again, I want to thank everybody for attending this session. I think our, our panelists were, the background is incredible. And please feel free to ask us any questions after the session is over. Thank you. Quick question, two parts. You talk about um, retention being the next big thing versus acquisition and with the cost of acquisition going up in retention customer experience slash customer service how do you see uh, the money the money going from acquisition to retention and is that a space that makes sense uh, yes I totally I mean this is this is, a, this is the product development versus uh, you know any other investment I mean if, if I can prove to the people with the purse strings that it's better to invest in retention, progression features, then marketing, uh, then you should shift money in that direction. And I, and I think that that's, that's what you're seeing. The, the ARPDAO lifts are not largely around us finding a new manufacturer or a new popular game. It's about metagame investment. We invested in uh, two, two major prongs. One is these, these, these progression elements that keep players engaged longer, get them to come back more frequently, uh, in providing more monetization opportunities, but we also invested heavily in merchandising. Merchandising has changed dramatically over the last year or two uh, about segmenting and targeting and getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, the right deal to the right player at the at the right time when they're most likely to convert. And that's a lot of the technologies that we've invested in. There, uh, multivariate testing, machine learning, all those are designed on trying to further segment your audience to give them exactly the game they want at exactly the price that they'll convert for. Uh, and so that's, I mean, if, you know, most people say those, those things need to happen hand in hand, and I think that they do, but if your product isn't featured, full featured enough, then you're gonna be throwing away your marketing dollars, and so you should take your marketing dollars and invest in a better product. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty straight, uh, pretty straightforward calculation. Um, if you do like a 10% improvement or to say 20% improvement in day one retention or even day three, day seven, uh, you get a much better improvement in your overall profitability than a, you know, even a 20% reduction in CPI. Um, so focusing on that retention is, is really um, what causes us to kind of improve um, because at the end of the day, we're all competing against like for the same people on the acquisition side. Um, so we're more or less just trying to get to best practice. And from an, a retention standpoint, I don't think we're even, there, I, I think kind of the sky's the limit um, in terms of where we can get to on, on the acquisition side. There's a CPM that we pay, and that's it. So if you look at the chart that Adam put up earlier showing that DAU is growing quarter over quarter, there's not more social casino players. Right? That's not suddenly we discovered a new country to start advertising in and they just start showing up. This is us getting the same players to play more frequently. They, so they show up as DAU more often than they were. Right? That's, all per, that's all engagement. So the, and that's why ArcDAO is also going up at the same time. Normally you would think if DAU goes up, revenue per user goes down. Right? They're, 
they have an inverse relationship. But if it's the same players coming back and they're super engaged in your product, they're gonna spend even more, and that's why you see ARPDAO's going up at the same time. Thank you so much.